And unlike the other HP Visualize workstation, this one here indeed responds to the configure monitor command. The other one said no graphics. This one here indeed says graphics 3. And as you can see, the resolution there 1280 by 1024, their internal type 12. This is what we did not get on the other one. And uh, yeah, let's see what booting is doing. And the Unix fun continues, as you can see there. It's trying to boot HP UX, but then it says they're invalid fast size value. Set fast size to all and reboot, so whatever that wants, but why can't it just work? I understand the environment battery is empty, but why can't the stuff still auto boot? Like with this SGI Octane with Arix, this is this typical, it's Unix, we know this is not. So let's see what setting this value is changing. So this is how the boot up with the reset looks with the Siri console working from the beginning. Okay, so even with this size set to all, it doesn't boot. Cannot find standard VM Unix or VM Unix. And they may have been so clever to wipe the hard drive, which certainly would be standard procedure in such companies. Now we could check the hard drive, but I quit X and zoomed the file system and unplugged my root device which is hanging here so don't try this at home obviously i can't run any new programs here and log in or whatsoever because each file system access will error out but i preloaded the module for the usb and run screen i had to run screen so that it's in the cache as it wouldn't load any new program of the disconnected usb the total joy of one USB port and why we want more than one USB port. And as I unplugged my root device, I can't also do any direct screen recording here. But I wanted to show some low level tips and tricks. So booting this Linux system, obviously I don't have the root password anyway. And it also would not give me a login. And the reason is that it does not have here serial console sync enabled. And to circumvent that, I booted with um, this IPL firmware interfacing enabled so that this Palo would allow me to edit the configuration to add init equals bin bash. So now we booted with init equals bin bash. And to edit this, we first mount the root file system read writable. Remount and then edit the init tab. You see, the refresh is not the super fastest as we're running over 9600 serial terminal. So we uncommence this serial line directly, remount this read only. And let's see, so somehow proc is not mounted, although it says mounted. Yeah, it says proc, but somehow it's not mounted. So um, type proc and let's see so I saw in the so from the PA risks I got this is the uh, slightly fastest this is running at 236 megahertz the other ones are running at 200 and this one also has slightly more cache the others had 512 instruction cache and one megabyte of data cache this one has a whole whopping two megabyte of instruction and data cache and one interesting thing is that this PA risks, instead of having first and second level cache, only had first level cache, and that one a rather large one. So back in the day, they may have had some performance advantage simply by having a larger first level cache running at a higher frequency than other systems with a super small first level cache and not as fast second level caches. Interesting design choice. Also interesting to see and learn all the different things they have done back in the day. So as this is the fastest of those machines, I will most likely match and mix some of the things like the second SCSI controller and also CD-ROM because this one doesn't have the CD-ROM and floppy there. So I will likely max out one of those machines and then give the other things away. So also if you want one of those machines, either this PA-RISC or one of my spare Sun Microsystems Ultra 5, let me know. 
I will give a couple of those away. Don't forget to share, like and subscribe and leave in the comments below if you are interested in one of those systems. As they are relatively heavy, especially the PA risk, keep in mind that local pickup may be favorable. Now I guess we can reboot. I changed the log into the syrup port. And uh, what else did we want to do? Ah, yeah, the root password actually, the root password. So let's set another root password as we are already in here with init equals bin bash. So read write password. So I guess we change this to test. Was changed successfully, otherwise we couldn't log in when we reboot now. So then let's reboot. To stop the auto boot as so often you can press a key here and then if you boot it would ask you if you want to interact with this IPL and only if you do this you can edit the payload this HP Linux loader configuration and yeah you see otherwise the configuration here is the fixed one that didn't ask you anything and just load the kernel quite some devices. Interestingly there will be some SCSI errors here, quite many of those, of some secondary SCSI port or so. And also with the screen we can scroll back. So also quite some system devices here, Raven, Audio, RS232 and such. And yeah, here so here here come some SCSI errors that we probably can ignore from some secondary SCSI bus so it takes a while. As usual the annoying thing with this old kernel I saw already there 2.4 somewhere maybe it's even written there 2.4.17 so quite old from uh, 2002 from Stone Age and as I said in other videos already that is really annoying that we can't use a new glibc and such with an old kernel so if I would copy my T2 binaries over they would not work, they would just either do nothing or print out that the kernel is not new enough. And that is really annoying that they can't have a little bit of backward compatibility there. So this does not help me so much in just copying some binaries over to the hard drive. Instead I would also need to copy my kernel already and try to test boot that kernel to have a new kernel running for my system. Of course we want this in the long term anyway but otherwise it would have been a nice early quick and dirty test. That's what we got from using glibc and such. So there will be multiple steps. First copying a new T2 kernel over, wiring, editing this into the payload bootloader and then also as a second step only then copy the binaries next. Alternatively we could skip all of this and try to network boot this. However network booting on this PA risk involves packing this with payload into some combined binary to load. So this is an additional step of error. So maybe I will indeed start instead of network booting copy the things over. So root and test. No. Hmm. Sort I changed it to test though. Even better I just found here this tiny USB hub. In my bag I found this in the office in some parts box. But this is the point with these one USB things. You need to travel with so much nonsense that you already forget with what kind of nonsense you travel with. Here's my awesome Apple USB Ethernet dongle thing and of course here's some nice flat Ethernet cable. So let's forward here some local Wi-Fi to the PA risk and get some network going. So this is a different than graphic cards. This is a more old-fashioned one and this is a Visualize FX one here in the other system that has in general better specs and such but I guess doesn't have a Linux driver so, so this would only have text mode and Linux or so. As far as I read this FX are based on PA risk CPUs themselves so they use four or so PA risks to render the graphics or so if that information is correct. Otherwise the systems are identical as far as I can see except the slightly faster CPU in this one and different memory configuration. So that apparently is bank zero or so, also here. So I wanted to take memory out of this one. So I guess this one 
and then we probably want to plug it into the same bank in the other one. Puerto Rico, I wonder if they still produce things there. So this are 64 Mac. And so this model maybe let's take one out. So this one's also from Puerto Rico. Interesting that they don't have the size directly visible on this ones. This ones have written here 64 megabyte. So, but this are 128. For whatever reasons they don't write it there. So that could give us 300 something megabyte. Let's see if that works. And then I will probably also screw the storage module over. Changing the I.O. module as this was missing from my first video when the SD card had an error from the other day. So unscrew here. and then put it out like this. In my first video you have seen the I.O. module already. Just that on this one, this is the original HP cable. That's the first box I picked up, it did not have. And this one has this metal rails here, I guess. Maybe I should take it out for this video, huh? Here's it. Snaps in here. At the side with with this ones. So this kind of rails were missing on the first one, which made me pick up the other ones also because when I picked this up initially, this basement had three of those, and I thought I only need one, uh, so I took the like cleanest looking. In retrospect, this was the least dusty and cleanest looking. The graphic board on those does not really appear to work, and it didn't have this storage rails here. And it it's always annoying to have the hard drive storage without the proper tray mount there. So that was the only reason I drove there and picked up the other ones. Because initially I thought I only need one and I leave the others for other people to have fun obviously. But nobody in four weeks time came there, was interested. So as nobody was interested, I got just the other ones as well. Which I'm lucky because not only this rails also as this one had slightly faster processor so I unexpectedly have a slightly faster processor now as well which also is another lesson learned the most clean one is not always the one that is best running so this is a more populated module with a floppy and CD drive together with a hard drive so now we can just swap them out. This has slightly different UV fading here though. So maybe in Berlin I take the extra work and and actually swap the at least the plastic here or something. But first we need to power them on and test boot them now. And then obviously finally get T2 booted and running. So this memory works, however the configuration is slightly curious, as you can see I can right now only guess, but I would think that this is a physical address or something. And I wonder that this group start at 1, as you can see there is bank 3, 3, 0, 2, and the slots however are 0 AB and 1 AB, so this numbering and banks uh, are really curious. The memory was plugged in in this order in all of the systems, so I will probably double check with the service manual another day or so. Anyway, it works, so I also wonder that, that group 1 is listed first, but yeah, really funny, this numbering system. Now that is slightly funny, while the memory appeared to be working, with the more memory the Linux kernel was consistently 
hanging after checking partition tables on the SCSI bus. So as you've seen, we're getting this many SCSI areas here, which may be normal as there is nothing on the bus, not even Terminator, maybe. But so where is it by the way? Somewhere here was at least fortunately screen doesn't allow us to scroll back as much. Yeah, I just took the memory out. As ah, here, here is this. So with the additional memory installed, it would hang here and not continue that for whatever reason. So that is where it indeed hangs with more memory. Really strange. But next I will now finally try to network boot my own kernels and see how that's going then.